It's also chair of the UK Marine Animal Rescue Coalition of more than a quarter of a century has been a member of the scientific committee of the IWC. And uh, he's actually said that this speech reflects his own views, but uh, he is a man of huge experience and knowledge, and it's a real pleasure to have him speak to us today. So thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Dominic. That's very kind of you. Let's um, share the screen and start the PowerPoint. There we go. So, hello. The cetaceans, or as they're commonly known, the whales, dolphins and porpoises, currently constitute some 90 or so species and many discrete populations. And they live all across our increasingly busy seas and in some of our big river systems. I will focus on particular cetaceans and try and draw some lessons from them. This lovely photograph on my opening slide shows orcas seen off northern Norway just a few days ago in what might be deceptively, might deceptively appear to be a pristine situation. However, places where our activities are having little impact on such animals are increasingly rare. And I'll return to these orcas later. But first I have to illustrate for you how terrible our impacts on whales in the 21st century can be. This is a brooder's whale, photographed in mid-Atlantic. And as you can see, this one has what is almost certainly fishing netting caught in its mouth. There are goose barnacles growing on the netting. But we can't be sure if the whale was ensnared when the net was in active use, as happens in the majority of cases, and the barnacles have grown subsequently, or whether the whale became entangled after the net was lost. Either way, the whale has been left with this life-changing burden. If we look closer, you will see that the drag on the net is slowly pulling it through the upper jaw, causing a wound that is cutting into the bone. There are a multitude of cuts and scrapes on the side of the animal, which are being caused by the netting and the barnacles rubbing against it. And notice also the strange white marks on the body of the animal. Experts believe that these scars are probably the result of an earlier incident, a major boat strike. So this poor whale was likely recovering from significant injury, only to end up with this entanglement. On the other flank of the whale, he or she has picked up some hitchhiking organisms, showing that this animal has really been slowed down by the netting. And not surprisingly, the whale is also in poor body condition. The netting may well have compromised its ability to feed. This unfortunate whale is almost certainly on a long and painful journey to death, a journey that will take months or even years. For example, the average time for an entangled North Atlantic right whale to die from such an entanglement has been estimated at six months. That's six long, painful months, and that's the average. These chronic entanglements are a most severe welfare issue, and for some species and populations like the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale, clearly also a serious conservation matter. Many smaller cetaceans in many habitats are also taken incidentally in fishing nets. The figure that you've heard cited is a little dated now, but it is clear that for many populations, this is the most immediate factor pushing them towards extinction. I want to show you a much nicer image now of a brooder's whale from the excellent IWC CMS online whale watching handbook, which you can find on the IWC website. Consideration of brooder's whales gives me the opportunity to say something more. New species of cetaceans are still being discovered and this is much more than a scientific curiosity because of the very important role that species definitions play in directing our conservation efforts. Arguably, there are two main reasons for these new discoveries. First, some cetaceans are only very rarely encountered, and that would be particularly true in the case of the family of beaked whales, which live in the deep seas. Secondly, in the case of others, such as the brooders whales, which have not been well studied, what was once viewed as one global species, when subject to appropriate scientific scrutiny, turns out to be more than one. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, what was previously treated as a separate population of brooders whales is now known to be a distinct species. This is Rice's whale, or the Gulf of Mexico whale, 
or the American whale, the last name suggested because it is limited to USA waters, perhaps the only baleen whale species living within the territory of a single nation. And what a responsibility this now is, because there are only about 50 of them left in this very busy sea area. This is arguably the most endangered whale on Earth, and second only to the vaquita of the Gulf of California, which is the most endangered station, with just a few individuals thought to be surviving. And another sad situation for the whales in the 21st century, just touched on by Chris Packham, was revealed in January 2019, when a dead and emaciated 38-foot-long Rice's whale washed up on the shore of Florida's Everglades National Park. Post-mortem revealed a single small sharp piece of stiff plastic had perforated its stomach lining. There were no other injuries. One small piece of plastic, one small piece of marine debris had killed this mighty whale. Moving to my second example, that's a bottlenose dolphin. We all know what bottlenose dolphins look like, right? It is the most recognizable of all the cetaceans. But again, it is not just one global species. Two species and three subspecies have so far been described. And here, in fact, is a photograph of another newly defined taxon. This is Lahili's bottlenose dolphin, a large form found in the coastal waters of West and South Atlantic Ocean off the coasts of Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. And again, no sooner was it recognized in 2018 than it was realized to be in trouble. And there are perhaps only 360 mature individuals left and the population is thought to be in decline. Due to their low numbers, high site fidelity and restricted coastal distributions, Lahili's bottlenose dolphins are particularly sensitive to local anthropogenic impacts. And the same could be said of many small populations of other cetaceans living in close contact with us. Broadly, the factors threatening the Healy's dolphin look something like this, and we've already heard about some of them. There's fishing, bycatch, but also removal of prey, degradation and loss of habitat, shipping, uh, threatening ship strikes and disturbance, and also disturbance from recreational activities and chemical pollution, including substances which will affect the animal's health and their reproduction. And then we have discharges of solid wastes, garbage adding to marine debris. And if we add to this slide the threats that would be affecting brooders whales, the same, pretty much the same would be true for them. But we would also add oil spills, because noting the habitat of, of Rice's whale in the Gulf of Mexico, this is an area very busy in terms of oil production. And also whaling. Historically, these tropical whales, like many of the bigger whale species, were hunted especially in their case from the 1970s, but they are still being hunted in Japan. And I must also mention noise pollution, because for animals that live in a medium where sound travels so much better than in air, and which primarily perceive their world using their remarkable and refined sense of hearing, the chronic noise pollution that we put into oceans from, in particular, our shipping, will disturb and fog their world. Additionally, the incredibly powerful noises that we use there for fossil fuel exploration or in marine military activities will at worst wound them and sometimes lead to their deaths. And we do need to now factor in the widespread effects of climate change. So this array of threats is a good indication of what is affecting cetaceans all over the world at the moment. Last year, more than 360 scientists from more than 40 countries, two of whom will be on your panel later on, released an open letter stating their grave concerns for cetaceans worldwide. And I'm going to quote from that letter. You can see it on the screen. The lack of concrete actions to address threats adversely affecting cetaceans in our increasingly busy, polluted and overexploited and human-dominated seas and major river systems means that many, one after another, will likely be declared extinct within our lifetimes. Even the large whales are not safe. The recent listing of the North Atlantic right whale as critically endangered, reveals the serious failure of its relatively wealthy range state countries to address a critical decline. Moreover, the factors driving this ongoing decline are well known and we believe could be addressed. And they went on to highlight the other species and many discrete populations that have been found to be threatened. And they concluded by calling on countries to take precautionary action to ensure these species and populations are adequately protected and to strengthen the relevant international bodies 
including the International Whaling Commission. Let us compare the current activities of the IWC with that list of threats that I've just shown you. And some of these have already been touched on, and you'll hear some more details when Sue Fisher uh, takes the floor later on. But we have the bycatch mitigation initiative. We have a global whale entanglement response network. We have the scientific committee's work. We have the task teams that Andre very kindly mentioned, including one for the Healy's bottlenose dolphins. And we have a slew of work under the conservation committee including the conservation action plans for a number of taxa. And I really must not forget the climate change work that the scientific committee is overseeing at the moment, because their workshop starts a little later on on this uh, today. So this is a very dynamic situation with the IWC working in all these areas. Returning finally to those extraordinary orcas. Orcas are found all over the world many distinct populations with specific morphology and particular behaviours have now been recognised. Young whales learn from older whales, and in orca societies, the older female, perhaps the Jane Goodall of the troop, leads the pod, sharing the wisdom of her years and what she learnt from her forebears. Should we be seeking, seeking to conserve these cultural population units? Those populations, for example, that know how to exploit the resources in a particular habitat, such as where the good rubbing beaches are and where the fattest fish can be found at particular times of year? I will answer my own question, of course. Yes, we should. For their sakes and for the sake of the integrity of the marine systems that they are part of. And we need to recognise that these cultural units may be very vulnerable if we do something to suddenly alter their habitat and prey supply. And that could be through the effects of climate change or some other of our encroachments into the marine environment. Dominic, I have one take home message I'd like to offer before I close, and that is that the more closely we look at cetaceans, the more we find out how remarkable they are, and the more it becomes apparent that they deserve and they need precautionary action from us to protect them and their distinct populations and their cultures and their habitats. The IWC is playing a significant role in this, and this should be supported and expanded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. A uh, wonderful and very thoughtful presentation on, on, on some of the key challenges we face protecting these incredible animals and the threats that we 